Good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry we missed last week, but I was sick. Hopefully you guys can all hear my voice well enough. Um, you see here, I probably should make sure this is all pinned in. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so where we left off, I believe, after being sick for a week, was we had left off <clears throat> in chapter 30. The enemy within at the part that says get angry. And if you remember, <clears throat> he just started explaining to us that we had basically gotten used to suffering. And we've gotten used to hearing the voice of our Yetahara, the Hasitan, talking to us. And he is not nice when he talks to us y'all so <clears throat> in the section on page 321 saying get angry he says a verse in psalms 4 5 4 chapter 4 verse 5 says <clears throat> infuriate yourself and do not sin the gemara in brachot 5a expands on that a person should constantly infuriate his good inclination and unleash it against his bad inclination. <clears throat> so the Pietzna Rebbe writes, you cannot distance yourself, or sorry, you cannot distance your evil inclination unless you learn to hate him. Meaning to awaken in the heart a hatred towards him for his desire to annihilate you from both words and to confuse your mind and heart through the awakening of hatred in your heart. It will be easy for you to conquer him. Okay, so that makes me think of when... Uh, Yeshua HaMashiach went through the temple turning over the tables of the money changers. You know, he he had that righteous zeal, that righteous anger to clean out his father's house. And if we are not, are we on, are we not also a temple for Hashem's spirit in in essence, our soul? The 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 um <clears throat> Neshima that resides within us is from Hashem. It's the pure soul from Hashem. So we need to be able to recognize the voice of, of Hasitan. And instead of giving it that mercy and grace, because we don't want to blame ourselves, we have to recognize it and separate it from ourselves and give it no mercy. That's when we started saying, oh, no, I hear you again. I am not listening to you. You need to take a step back. Back off, Jack. Um, <clears throat> he says that um, in this section, the power of Netzach, he says phenomenal strength that derives through the Sephira of Netzach, the power to complete, conquers and emerges victorious. How do we activate and reveal this powerful yet latent force? We start by realizing that we are in a fierce competition. When a person realizes that he is in a competition, that the other party is his worst enemy who wants nothing less than to destroy his life in this world and the next. He will become extremely angry and fight with all he has. If we fight, we win because Hakadosh Baruchu steps in and helps us. So this is the thing. If you're just going to sit back and not fight, you're just going to give up. Well, why? If you're not going to fight for yourself, who will? I know we've all heard that before, right? But if you're going to stand up and fight for yourself, not only are you fighting for yourself, but Hashem himself is also fighting for you. Rabbeinu Bakya assures us of that. Our job 
in this life is to go to battle. So we're warriors, (laughs) y'all. We are warriors. We got to stand up and start fighting and not let the Hasutan lie to us, trick us, deceive us into accepting all his little whispers and lies as truth because they're not true. You know, we need to learn to activate that will to win and to channel it toward meaningful undertakings because um, Netzach brings forth monumental fulfillment and growth there is no greater pleasure or thrill in the world because each win brings us closer to our mission so in the words of the pietzna rebbe then you will feel a type of pleasure within yourself you may not understand the meaning of this pleasure you may feel that it comes simply in response to your having been delivered from your desire That it is the pleasure for your victory against your desire of having been a warrior in the army of Hashem. Your understanding of this pleasure is correct, but incomplete. There is another cause behind this pleasure, a cause unknown to you. This pleasure that you are aware of is the pleasure of your victory comes from the cause, excuse me, comes from a cause unknown to you. A part of your soul was clothed in a polluted garment of an evil feeling. You removed that evil garment. And so this part of your soul was revealed to you without it. And that is the unfathomable reason for your pleasure. You feel that within your victory, you have come closer to holiness. Primarily, it has brought you closer to the holiness within yourself, to your soul. Nitzach teaches the Pietzna Rebbe, reveals latent powers within us. It squeezes brand new toothpaste out of the tube that you never dreamed contained one more iota, like he talked about in the beginning of the book. An aspect of this self is set free From the grip of Hasitan, from the shackles of limitation. So, y'all, what I'm seeing here is that we have to start recognizing Hasitan's voice. And every time we hear that voice, we push it off. We put it away. We're not going to listen to that voice. We're going to keep moving forward and doing the right thing. And the more we push that that voice away and say, no, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to believe the things you're saying about me. I'm not going to believe the things you're telling me I should try to do. I'm not going there. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep moving forward on the path that I'm still on. The more that we do that, the more we separate ourselves from Hasitan. And it was interesting because um, not this past Shabbos, but the Shabbos before I was um, sh- talking with um Emmett and and Deborah and I was sharing with them how after I had read this to study for our class that I was just blown away because Hashem just hit me with it the next morning because I was doing our morning prayers and I don't know if you all have noticed this but let me turn to the page in the sitter in our morning prayers it says um Okay, hold on just a second. Sorry. I know you don't want to hear the dead silence stuff, but you got to find the right one. There's quite a few of our prayers in the morning. Okay, not that one. Okay, so it's the one that starts off with, um, may, may it be your will, Lord my God and God of my fathers to protect me this day. And it goes through all the things that we're asking Hashem to protect us from, you know, when people do and say things about us that aren't true or or mean or evil or underhanded, right? Well, at the very last line, it says, and from the retribution of Gehenna. Gehenna is, you know, some people call that hell. But I was thinking about the retribution of Gehenna and it's like, if we don't choose to separate ourselves 
from that voice of Hasetan, from that Yatahara. We have to separate ourselves from it. If we don't start pushing that away and saying, no, I'm not going to listen to you, then we start identifying with it. And we become one with it. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to become one with that voice. I want to become one with Hashem. So if we want to have that salvation from the retribution of Gehenna, if we want to have that closer walk with Hashem, we have to keep pushing that voice of Hashem away. And that, you know, just to remind you guys, that's the voice that's telling you that you suck. You don't suck. You know, God made you in his image. And he, the Torah says we are beautifully and wonderfully made. He doesn't make mistakes. He made you exactly the way he made you with your predispositions and inclinations and talents and faults. Perfectly. He made you exactly how he wants you. And um, the author for the book that we're going to do after this one says you're perfectly imperfect. I love that perfectly imperfect there's there's nothing in all of our lives that you should be in the state over because if you think about it we are all just part of Hashem's song he's singing the song not us and you're you're fill, filling the role he set you to fulfill and what is your choice do I want to be one with the voice of Hasatan or do I want to be one with the voice of Hashem this is our choice. So when one is afflicted with a disease of the soul, it causes bad to seem good and good to seem bad. Darkness is light and light is seen as darkness. Bitter to taste sweet and sweet to taste bitter. Situations that literally seemed good and sweet one day can seem evil and bitter the next. I don't know about you all, but there seems to be a whole lot of people these days who fit into that category and again how do we avoid that by not allowing the voice of the Yatahara to influence us by recognizing it you know God said I'm beautifully wonderfully made and you're telling me I suck I don't suck you need to back off Jack gotta keep remember them remembering that <laughs> okay so <clears throat> he tells us the story of this bride it's like the day before a wedding and she's like no I can't marry the guy and he, it was to illustrate this whole thing about when some you know we're, we're listening to that voice we're allowing the doubt to creep in it takes what's good it makes it look bad and and so he he helped her to not listen to her foot, but listen to her head <laughs> is how he puts it. Um, he was saying, you know, he, he painted the picture for her. You know, if you go through with your marriage, so far up to this point, it's been all beautiful and wonderful in your eyes. This would be the future you would see for yourself. If you cancel it now, this would most likely be your future. That You know, trying to paint these two stark images because he's trying to help her to see that last minute doubts usually are not founded on anything besides the Yatahara trying to make you confused. Okay, so he says we need to learn to unleash the power of Netzach inside of us. We need to become infuriated at the voice that is preventing us from reaching our potential and dragging us down into the gutter. We never sell ourselves short, he does. The ugly, bad, filthy Satan that will knock us down because he doesn't want us to finish Sha'at, succeed in business, feed our families with respect, help others, treat ourselves with dignity. He wants us unemployed, not going to minions, not treating our spouses as we should. He wants us to underestimate ourselves all day long. As long as we are alive, he will keep trying hour after hour, day after day, through voices playing inside your head. You are no good. Look at how much wrong you have done. 
how little you have done right. Others are so much better than you. Look at what they have done and you don't have, or what they have and you don't have. So many wasted opportunities. It's pointless at this juncture to even try because it's all hopeless. So much has been lost, never to be regained. If that doesn't work, he will try another tactic. He will lure you with fake promises of happiness and fulfillment and lead us down a path of emptiness and desolation. Satan was someone, Satan as someone who runs around in, okay, so He's going to review, he he says that Rav Nachman of Breslov describes the Satan as someone who runs around the marketplace with his hands closed and asking every person, what do you think I have in my hands? And so and then everybody's chasing him around because they want to know what he has in his hands. And when he gets there, he opens up and there's nothing. And he says, <clears throat> um, because everybody thinks, oh, he's got he's got what I need, that one little thing I need, that wealth, the fame, the fulfillment, honor. And in the end, it's you know, when it's all too late and your life has been lived, opens his hand and he's fooled us all because there's nothing there. So <clears throat> and he says, Is this all making you really angry? Good, it should be. That's precisely what the Mida of anger was given to us for. So just like we have um to balance our arrogance and our humility with you know too much humility causes the fall of the temple too much arrogance causes the fall of everything else you know in the same way we need to be able to balance our anger and our peace right our anger and our shalom if our anger is non-existent we won't go to battle we won't fight we won't tell Hasetan where to stick it but if we have no peace and we're ruled by our anger, we can't think straight. We can't do anything right. Right. So we got to remember that we have anger for a reason. God didn't give you these midot just so that he can tell you not to use them. He wants you to use them in the appropriate way. And our most appropriate way to use our anger is against the Hasitan. Um. <clears throat> So he wants us to, you know, this is the, the reason he was given to us. And he wants us to unleash it against Hasitan. The Pietzna Rebbe writes that a person cannot successfully vanquish the Satan until he learns to utterly despise him. If ever one was meant to activate his power of visualization, it's in the battle against Hasitan. Create an image of him. And see him ta uh, talking to you when that uh, insidious voice starts up. Mine has yellowed teeth, blisters on his face, and smells like the sewer. What does yours look and smell like? I think it's interesting that he talked about smell there. Because isn't it supposed to be that when the Messiah brings us all back into Jerusalem, that he stands at the gate and smells each one of us to see if we're the real deal? So are we going to smell like the real deal or are we going to smell like Hasitan? What does Hasitan smell like? And it goes on and says we should yell at him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he talks about how his grandfather, the uh, Holy Rav Naftali of Rup Rupschitz, was uh, known to display great self-sacrifice in order to immerse himself in the mikvah each morning. Once during a bitter cold Polish winter, he went down to the river to immerse himself only to find it frozen solid. As he stood there in the bitter cold, hacking away at the ice, the voice inside him was saying, Naftali, Naftali, what are you doing? Don't you think that Hashem would understand if you skipped a day? Look at how cold it is outside. You are uh, obligated to protect your health. Go back home where it's warm. No one will ever know. My Zadie just kept on hacking away while the voice kept on pro, uh, protesting. 
When he finally broke through the ice, he jumped into the freezing water and immediately the voice changed its tune. Natali, Natali, how righteous you are. What is Zadig? Look your level of self-sacrifice. Who can compare to you? You risked your life to serve Hashem. How great is your reward? When he came up out of the water, he said, in, he said to the voice, Thank you for clarifying something that has always troubled me. Hazal called you an old fool. And while I understood that you were old, it was you after all who spoke to Hava in the Garden of Aden so long ago. I always wondered, why do they call you a fool? And today I learned the reason. Did you not uh, did you have to jump into the ice cold water with me? Couldn't you have just waited for me outside <laughs> where it wasn't as cold and started your, um, he says, Gava speech about my righteousness after I came out? You really are a fool. So he was just McFain. And that has to be done in living water. And when you're in Poland back in the day, that meant you're jumping in a frozen lake. Zadokim would often speak this way of the Satan. They would often yell at the voice inside of them and they would pay close attention to his tactics. One need not get, uh, one need not be a great Zadok to want to win. Each of us can win. Uh, get better at lowering our tolerance to the enemy inside of us. And the more we recognize who is speaking to us, the more battles we will win. That's that separating ourselves from that voice. You got to learn how to identify his voice and recognize that that's not you. That voice is not you. We already mentioned the brilliance of Daf Yomi. And the ultimate steeple to steeple program. So that was much earlier on in the book. The story about the young boy who was on one of the death marches that the Nazis had um, the Jews do. And this was the young boy who, who was like, if I can just make it to the next steeple. As they were going through Poland and later on in life when he was relating the story, he's like, thank God there are so many steeples. Um, but he said, um, <clears throat> I recall when I started my first cycle, the enemy would badger me each day with put downs like you will never finish. It's too difficult. The challenge went away when I started retorting. Who's trying to finish? I am merely trying to learn tonight's lesson. Are you, are you suggesting that I'm incapable of even doing that? So it went on until the uh, lesson became as habitual as my morning coffee. And then the enemy finally let me alone. If we set realistic and achievable goals, we arm ourselves with ammunition that will vanquish the enemy. We are in a battle, a battle for purpose, mission, and success. His job is to derail us and our job is to build strategies to neutralize him so that we will prevail. Okay, so that brings us to the end of chapter 30. And the last chapter, full chapter of the book is chapter 31, Ups and Downs. We're going to go through that. And then the conclusion I'm going to leave for you guys to all read. So let's get into Ups and Downs. <clears throat> He starts off with giving us like a paraphrased version of the story of Yosef and, you know, trying to put us into Yosef's perspective. So we're, you know, Yosef, this young 17 year old boy, your relationships with your brothers have been up and down. And finally now you're in the cistern and you hear them debating over whether they should kill you or sell you or whatever. And next thing you know, you're being sold as a slave. And he says, <clears throat> As we try to place ourselves into Yosef's shoes, we wonder how he survived, let alone thrive. He did the ultimate, or he, he, how he did, how did he ultimately, sorry, reach a point where he had no hatred in his heart toward his brothers? 
or even toward Potiphar as evidenced by his willingness to marry Potiphar's daughter. While we cannot fathom such greatness, we can be sure that Yosef paved the road for each of us to weather life's ups and downs and to live with an elevated perspective during difficult times. This is what infuses us with the capacity to bounce back and thrive after setbacks. Yosef provided us with the antidote to the very worst of Satan's poisons, despair and loss of hope. When we defend, or sorry, defined success in an earlier chapter, we pointed out that Yosef Chazedek has the distinction of being the only person in Torah to bear the title of a uh, successful man. As we com- uh, contemplate what he endured and how he excelled through his travails, we can begin to understand why he earned the coveted title. Yosef displayed remarkable resiliency and a positive attitude traits that helped to pave the road to success. Without resiliency, life wears you down and your motivation and zest for life dry up. Think of resiliency and the durability of your energy tank and the motivation as the fuel inside. If the tank crack, sorry, if the tank cracks, all the fuel leaks out. So <clears throat> the first thing we're going to talk about here is our attitude. Okay. Yosef's resiliency was ironclad because he applied a positive interpretation to the events that transpired in his life. Not only in retrospect, but as they were happening. So let's talk about that for a minute. Because we oftentimes, you know, we'll be going through life and something crazy will happen. Or we're sitting here going, wait a minute, what happened? I just got thrown off the track big time. How, how, what's going on? What did I do? A lot of times it's not any of those things. We didn't necessarily get thrown off the track. We didn't necessarily um, do anything wrong. But that's our perspective at that moment. And our perspective oftentimes will color our attitude. Certainly when we're trying to get something done, we have a goal in front of us. Not achieving that goal the way we thought we would or our expectations are somehow not met. We can see that as a negative and we can we can bring to that because we're looking at it negatively from a negative perspective, we can bring to that this attitude that is also negative. When we experience life's inevitable losses or setbacks, our reaction mindset and attitude make all the difference. Putting matters in right perspective spares us emotional turmoil that causes us to lose motivation and hope. It is therefore imperative that we embrace healthy perspective on setbacks and they are a normal part of life. So our setbacks are normal and they actually contribute to our success. If we weren't given these setbacks, we'd be missing out on a lot of things actually. Um, He goes on to talk about how setbacks are the, are part of the fabric of life. He says that, um, I think it's Ezekiel 114, it teaches, and the life force flows or runs and ebbs or returns. These words are fundamental element of um, the work of the chariot on which most of Kabbalah is based. And they tell us that life is a series of ebbs and flows. And he goes on to use the example of a cardiograph, how you have like a straight line, a bump and a down bump and up and a straight line. And so cardi, you know, everybody's seen that up all the way down, back up to the line. And that's what our heart does every time, right? It's just up and down. And he goes on to say, 
<clears throat> but the Hazal teaches us that, that these ups and downs are part of life and woven into every fabric of creation. A constant flat line means a person has passed away. So if you're not going up and down, then you must be dead. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm not done with the ups and downs yet. Um, <clears throat> Rav Z uh, Zodok Hakohen um, confirms the fundamental value of setbacks in his ex explanation saying, a righteous person falls seven times and gets up. The Zodok will achieve levels of righteousness that are greater and greater with each fall and subsequent rise. This is what is meant with the words from uh, Devarim 31.1 and Moshe went. Unlike an angel, which is static being, a human being is here to move forward. And moving forward necessitates setbacks. Uh, Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu realized that he had reached his final destination. Sorry, y'all. <clears throat> he reached his final destination when he was unable to leave his current level. <clears throat> Excuse me. He realized that there was no setback forthcoming, and he could no longer arrive. At a higher level, he realized that it was time to pass from this world. So we're going to have, you know, ups and downs our whole life, no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're dealing with. And basically the message is, instead of getting alarmed by the things that don't happen the way we think they should, we need to welcome it. Because for as much as we have ups and downs, we are alive and we're still working. We're still growing. We're still fighting, right? <clears throat> okay, so uh, the Holy Megid of Chernobyl in his book teaches that rising can only occur after a fall. So you're not going to go any higher in your spiritual walk if you don't fall. I know the falling part's not as fun, but... In order to to reach those, you know, the, in order to get to those heights, we have to hit some lows that we probably didn't think we'd get hit. Um, <clears throat> because our purpose is to rise, the world uh, is created in such a way that nothing stays up forever. The fall gives birth to an even greater rise that will follow. Raf Nachman of Breslov teaches that when a person seeks to rise from level to level, he must experience a setback. Because setbacks lead to advancement. He cautions us that <clears throat> when we are experiencing a fall, we will firmly believe that these words were not meant for us but only for righteous people who are on the path of constant elevation. Nevertheless, he stresses this concept applies to every single one of us. Setbacks must precede advancement. That's huge, guys. If you really think about that, that's pretty big. And I don't know about you guys, but I mean, if, if a setback must proceed in advancement, then I would think that you get hit, you get hit, you get hit. And next thing you're like, okay, so what, what's, where's the good coming? Cause it's going to have to, I've been getting hit. So there's gotta be good coming around the corner, right? <clears throat> okay. So what are these, what are the benefits of the setbacks? Our attitude towards a uh, setback will improve the day that we begin to view them as beneficial as a prerequisite to success. Um, the thought that occurred to me at this point was, you know, because he was talking about the ebb and the flow um, of 
how everything, you know, the setbacks come ebbing and flowing. Well, the thing about that is, is that maintains the balance in the world. <clears throat> so without challenge, life ultimately loses its luster. If you didn't have the setbacks, if you didn't have the falls, you wouldn't value the good parts. Okay. Um, the Hassan so first says in Nida 48b that where a person to always have whatever he desired, he would utterly despise his life. Who uh, created a multitude of living things and their deficiencies. Okay, so we are blessing Hashem who created a multitude of living things and their deficiencies. Hashem created not just you, but also your deficiencies. And he created us in a way that we are always lacking something. The purpose of these deficiencies is conveyed in the subsequent words to sustain the soul of every living being. The needs and deficiencies we must face and overcome are what sustain us by giving us motivation and excitement to live and grow. The great things will only come to us after we yearn and pray for them. It's only in times of darkness that we yearn for light because it's human nature to become accustomed to long-term situations. Only when the situation worsens do we long for restoration of our former circumstances. The longing is the awakening from below, which initiates an even greater light from above. Hazal tells us that the tefillah we undertake during periods of darkness pave the way for us to rise from the fall. So our prayers, when we're going through those hardest times, are actually paving the way for us to make that rise. That's intense. <clears throat> In my note, I wrote to myself, it is so important to pray. And, and I think that it's, it's so important to pray every day, whether it's a good day or a bad day. And the reason for that is the more that we're praying at all times, it makes it that much easier to pray when it's hard. You know, if we're used to praying, if we're talking to God constantly, then when we're having those hard times and it's a little bit harder to get those prayers out, We've already trained ourselves to make it a little bit easier. It's like a mercy hiding in the back somewhere. If that makes any sense. Um, in times of darkness, we are able to activate the awesome power of hope. In the words of the Ramchal, in his lecture on hope, the hope for salvation that we muster during difficult times is what draws down blessing from above. Constriction was created for the sole purpose for us to be um, hopeful. And in doing so, draw down the light of the infinite. May his name be blessed. Times of darkness provide the setting in which the purpose of creation can best be fulfilled. If Hashem only if his only intent were to create the <clears throat> entity into which he could shine his light, it would seem that the heavens would have been all that he needed. However, Tanya teaches that the ultimate purpose of creation could not have been the existence of angels because they, because in their realm, there is no darkness. And only in darkness can light be revealed. That's deep, y'all. Darkness only exists in the realm of the human being. The Tanya teaches that the Hakadosh Baruch Hu desired a place to live in the lower worlds. And since his, he is infinite light, he is revealed most intensely in times of darkness. 
The darker the situation to which we fall, the more opportunity there is to fulfill the sole purpose of all creation, the revelation of Hashem's light. That is beautiful. Oh my gosh, that is so beautiful. Because I don't know about you guys, but when you do fall, you you know, you go down the the downsides of these things. <clears throat> it can seem lonely. It can seem like, you know, why is everything picking on me? What did I do? <laughs> You know, and the the point there is you're not that alone. It might feel like you are, but your feelings don't often dictate truth. Feelings are showing you how you're perceiving things. And that should be like a signal to you. If your feelings are super down and depressed, that you're perceiving things negatively. And we'll get into the negative and positive in the next book. But the, the point I'm making is, that, that should signal you to change how you're perceiving things. Okay, so um, Rav Shlomki continued, we earned something truly great through um, Mesra, oh, I can't say this right, Messi Ras Nefesh, that we demonstrated in coming here to Davin to pray. Um, okay, I think my page jumped. It jumped. I'm so sorry, y'all. Okay, so after we talked about the re revealing of Hashem's light, he goes into this story about how this rabbi, um, Shlomki, was walking through Jerusalem in the 1930s with his Talmudin, and as they had just finished davening and they come out and they started walking away from the um, oh gosh the hotel they had been praying at the hotel which apparently praying at the hotel on a Friday night in the 1930s was a very dangerous thing to do um, so they ha were leaving the hotel after praying and some a um, man comes out and punches him in the face. And his Talmudin are horrified at this. But he just starts laughing. And he looks to his Talmudin and says, imagine that a poor man comes to ask a rich man for a donation. And the rich man says, do you have change for five shekels? The poor man will know that he isn't getting very much. But if the rich man says, do you have change for 20 shekels? He knows that he's getting a bit more. But imagine if the man, the, the rich man says, do you have change for a thousand shekels? Then that poor man knows he's getting a ton of money, right? But the thing about it is, <clears throat> the reason he was laughing or smiling is because the greater the change that he has to give back, the greater the gift. Well, setbacks or getting punched in the face like that is seen as that change that we're giving back to Hashem. And that means that the gift that is uh, that follows is even greater. Okay. Setbacks squeeze the greatness out of us. They teach us that we are truly capable of <clears throat> they bring forth unrevealed potential that we would never have known on our own. And it's lying dormant within us. Adversity forges us into a stronger, improved vessel that will be capable of containing the greater good that will follow. Without suffering the fall, then the rising stronger would be too weak to contain the greater good that Hashem wants to send us and it would break us. I don't know about you guys, but the image in my head right now is you do not pour new wine into old wine skin. You need to make new wine in a new wine skin. And if you are an old wine skin, Hashem's trying to help you become a new wine skin. Faith and trust in Hashem and the positivity and optimism 
that express that exalted state have the greatest value during periods of darkness. Although we are tested in both good and challenging times, our faith is tested most during periods of difficulty. Wow. <clears throat> He goes on with this quote from um, Chazan Ish. <clears throat> it says, um, it is easy to speak of trust at times when the need to trust does not play an important role in one's life. You know, when times are good, right? But it's much more difficult to have trust at times when it's indeed called for. The real test that can determine whether a person really believes what he is saying, whether he really does place his trust in Hashem or has merely trained himself, oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry, to chirp, bit of coon, bit of coon, without having it penetrate his heart, is when he encounters a situation that demands that he indeed places trust in Hashem. At those times, the role of trust is to guide his actions, to heal, and to soothe him. That is incredible. That is so incredible. I love that. It's so beautiful. That just shows us how much that, you know, Hashem teaching us that we need to trust him is not just about a good me don't we need to have but it shows Hashem's mercy and his grace at the same time it's like three for one I love three for ones two for ones five for ones I love that <clears throat> when we internalize each of these bullet points we can ultimately come to see life struggles and setbacks as labor pains that lead to birth I know that's got to speak to y'all <laughs> and growth. So, okay. You know, Magan Yishiano, we have all been going through a lot of hardships lately. I know we have, I have, I've heard from each one of you guys, how much you have. So the point is that we're in, we're in birth pains. Okay. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the Messiah we're in birth pains. The new year is coming. We're in birth pains. Rosh Hashanah, the, the, the feast of trumpets, we're, we're welcoming in our new king. Well, I'm looking for him. I hope y'all are. It's that time. We need our king. Okay. Uh, the birth, uh, the lead to birth pains and growth. The Baal Shem Tov tells us that <clears throat> The Nisiyon challenge of difficult periods comes from the loss of hope and the feeling of abandonment that permeates us. We misinterpret Hashem's intentions. And in doing so, we disconnect ourselves from trusting in him. So we can't do that, guys. We can't disconnect ourselves. We have to keep trusting him and not misinterpret what's going on. You know, one of the things that made me think about too was um, Job. You know, when he went through all of the troubles he went through, they kept trying to say, what did you do wrong? He's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Exactly. You didn't do anything wrong. Neither did you. You are perfectly imperfect. You got to keep that in your mind. So don't blame yourself. It's extremely important for a person to internalize the setbacks are a normal part of life because while we are meant to learn something from both ups and downs, we are not meant to blame ourselves by thinking that we are being punished for something we have done wrong. In certain rare instances, that may be the case and challenging times should therefore motivate us towards introspection but in most cases, punishment has absolutely nothing to do with it. On the contrary, Hashem is placing an opportunity for growth and abundance before us. As Rav Nachman taught us, 
The Satan will not allow us to believe this when darkness falls. He will try and con convince us that we are an exception to the rule and no exceptions to that rule. Darkness always brings greater light. So pray. Praying is what we got to do, right? The one that Hashem loves, he rebukes. So think about that for a minute. He's going to correct you. When you do things wrong, he will correct you. And that's why, not because he hates you, not because he's punishing you, it's because he loves you. An indication that a person is experiencing a pure setback that he doesn't is that he doesn't lose, lose his motivation to pray for salvation. Okay, so we're going to end with this part here. It says fighting this uh, the same battles throughout our lives requires us to negate what we want and focus on the underlying purpose of life to battle and overcome and do so over and over and over not so that we can feel victorious but so that we can carry out the will of Hashem while we may not see it the hair's breadth of progress that we are making on this world is moving the upper world in infinite ways and giving Hakadosh Buruku outstanding pleasure there is nothing wrong with us battling our way out of darkness. Battling our way out of darkness is the purpose of life. And we should therefore expect this to be the case for our entire lives. Even to uh, learn and look forward to being, we need to look forward to it being this way. So I'm going to let y'all read the conclusion, which is just a couple of little paragraphs there, but I would love to hear what you guys are thinking. Cause I don't know about you guys, there is so much in this chapter and the, the last part of the chapter before. So please, please, please unmute your mics and let me hear from you. Okay, come on now. Don't y'all run to be first. I know it's a lot to think about. I don't have the book to read the conclusion, but I do. I was. I can say something that I thought about when you were talking about um, the Satan's voice. Um, you know, at least for me, being able to recognize his voice is one thing, and but the other one is like trying to remove seeds that were planted in times where um, maybe I couldn't get get them out. So, for instance, like when other people are saying like you listed so many words that were being said during that I know for me like those are words that I, I would have heard constantly um from someone that I was living with so like now that I'm out of that situation trying to get those words out of the heart so sometimes you can hear them and you know okay this is not of God this is the enemy and even when the person was saying it you know that but mm -hmm. being able to remove it where it's no longer producing like that fruit of low self-esteem or low confidence or things nice. of that nature is still I think a part of that healing journey and I know there are maybe many people that are like trying to that can have they understand the discernment but maybe struggling with uh fully getting the root of the words out of that because those things have been said so many times so well and that's why this is a battle 
I mean, you're not going to win every battle, right? But it takes a whole lot of battles to win a war. And, and so maybe one battle you win and one battle you don't, but the fact is that we're supposed to keep fighting. And I think that it's that effort that we put forward to push that away, whether the voice is telling you you're a horrible, terrible person, or, Hey, just sit there for a while. You don't need to go anywhere or do anything. And, you know, and then before you know it, your whole life's been just cut, you know, become sitting, you know? Or whether it's, you know, go spend this here and go buy that there. And before you know it, you can't pay your rent, you know, whatever the voice is telling you to do, learning how to identify it is huge and not equating it to yourself. That's not me thinking that. That's Hasitan. And I don't have to listen to him. And the more you start identifying it and telling yourself the truth, I don't have to listen to him. That will help dig those roots out. And it might take the whole rest of your life, but that's the point. That's what we were here to do is to get that out. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's not that we can't achieve it because Hashem doesn't put us here to do something we can't achieve. He hasn't, he hasn't designed us so that we would be fruitlessly working away for forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. But I get what you're saying too. I mean, when you're so used to hearing that, you're, it, it's almost like, but this is what I know. And you don't want to necessarily let it go but then if you think about it in the starker terms of I need to separate myself from Hashem I can't stay in that abusive relationship anymore because that's what yeah, I wouldn't say I wouldn't want to let it go I'm saying like prime example I think one of them was what I forgot what the words you were saying but like you know you work with you're this you're that like all of those negative mm -hmm. things they weren't something that I would have thought of about myself ever. But then when you have someone saying those things to you and you're a person who wants to take accountability and you also want to make sure that you're doing things right, you're constantly trying to make sure, okay, am I doing right? Am I not making that mistake? Am I? And so it can get, there can be that line of, okay, how much of this is just narcissistic <laughs> abuse? And then how much of this is uh, me having to take accountability for what I, you know, what I need to do. And I think there's a balance. And then there's, I mean, there are parts work, you know, so it even says in um, J James that, um, that the enemy is going to tempt you with the desires of your own heart. He's, it's not anything new that you're being tempted with. It, these are things that are within yourself. So like, right. For you to say, it's not me. It may be a part of you. Maybe maybe he's talking to a child part that felt like they never got something. And, you know, so there's so much into those things where you're even doing that part work of, uh, you know, whatever. But, yeah. <laughs> well, and the things that he's saying here, I mean, you know, I found the, the part you were talking about. You're no good. Like how much you've, uh, how much wrong you've done, how little you've done right. I don't know about you. I mean, if you don't think these things about yourself, you're fortunate because I've thought all these things about myself. Yeah, and no, I, don't, I didn't think about those until I, I got told those things. Yeah, see, no, yeah, no, you're you're fortunate then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is that I think that the the point is the more that we identify and isolate those thoughts, we're supposed to take every thought captive and make it submissive to our yet our yet our heart heart of not the yet heart the good one, the good inclination. I'm saying the, the Hebrew words wrong. But the instead of the yetahara, the yet heart of we're supposed to make each thought submissive to the yes or her toe. Does that make sense? So we have to, we have to be able to start doing that meditation where we're able to step back and look at our thoughts like they're on the street and we're standing inside the shop window, watching them go past. 
And we need to be able to isolate them and say, you know what, that's that's how Satan there. That's not me. Because we are generally going to be kind to ourselves. So I think the thing that stood out to me most was that whole part about we hear these things and we think, oh, but I can't possibly be that bad. So I'm going to be kind to myself that's saying these bad things to myself, right? But we have to recognize that what we're doing really is we're, we're giving Hasitan a place to set up house. We're letting him live rent free in our head and we have to kick him out. <laughs> it's like, you're not going to stay here and eat my food and <laughs> use up my internet. <laughs> you know, we have to be able to say, I'm done with that. You know, I can recognize you now and I'm not going to let you fool me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, it can be hard sometimes, but we have, we have it within us to do it. So, good comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really good that she is recognizing that those things that keep cropping up are, are not from Hashem, but they're from from another place that yeah. is harming her and the more you recognize those and you know you talked about seeds being planted whenever you see that little plant cropping up in your life and you know it's from something that was planted that was evil snip that thing off and don't water it yes <laughs> insidious weeds <laughs> and when it comes up again do the same thing again yes because <laughs> yes. that's how it goes how it goes it keeps coming yeah i love it good, good. Hashem for the teaching tonight it's very good it is deep but you know hashem is setting us up for a lot of good things a lot of good things and and i think this book is a perfect segue into the next one so um but we're we've got uh rosh hashanah coming up this weekend so we'll probably take a couple weeks off after tonight, and then we'll start our new book after the high holy days are over. I'll I'll make an announcement and let y'all know when we'll be starting back up because we need to focus our attention on the high holy days and and all that is in that because I mean it's a huge spiritual time, very pro propitious. Is that the right word? Propitious time so i hope everybody's getting excited and ready for rosh hashanah and yom kippur and sukkot it's the best time of year i don't know about you guys but in our family we like to do s'mores during sukkot and that's one of my son's favorite he's like where's the s'mores <laughs> so <clears throat> anybody else have good comments about the lesson tonight it's okay if you don't, because we kind of went a little late. But anyways, um, it's been a pleasure having you all for the class. Again, the book that we've been doing is called You Revealed by Naftali Horowitz. And the next book that we're going to be doing after the High Holy Days is It's All the Same to Me by Moshe Gerst. And if you guys haven't had a chance, I would go ahead and get the book and read through it, you know, so that when we do come back together, everybody's already had a chance to go through it at least once. And then we can have some more hearty uh, discussions about this because there is so much packed into this teeny tiny little book. Um, and if you want to, he also has a really good YouTube channel and a Facebook presence. Um, where he's got different clips of his, you know, speaking and stuff where you're sitting here going, oh my gosh, that's such a good truth. And it's just a tiny little video clip. So thank you so much for coming to class tonight. And we hope to see you at Shul on Shabbos and hope everybody has a Lashana Tova and um, very good, sweet new year and, and is preparing for Yom Kippur also. Um, so we will hopefully see you guys um, on Shops. All right.